Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Позвольте пригласить вас. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. To those of you who blocked up the courage and time, let me invite uh, those of you to please take your seats in this room. If I may, I would like to begin this conference by saying, uh, dear Yelena Borisenko, Deputy Minister, dear Vladimir Pligin, dear Konstantin Dobrini, and uh, esteemed guests at this conference, let me open the conference and express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who is in this room. Above all, my gratitude goes to my foreign colleagues who came from here from far away in this turbulent time and joined us in this room to discuss an extremely important subject, important not just for Russia, but for the legal systems across the world, judiciary independence. And uh, defense attorney's influence on this independence is an essential issue. Let me remind those of you who are here, not for the first, maybe not even for the second time, that several years ago the forum raised uh, a very critical issue of competition among different jurisdictions. If I remember correctly, Dmitry Medvedev had something to say about that, and um, the Ch Chief Justice of the then um, High uh, Commercial uh, Court, Ivanov, and Justice Ivanov. Uh, it was really a critical, a crucial uh, issue, and at that time it seemed to be a, a topical issue as well. One of the reasons for the competition among jurisdictions, the jurisdictional competition, was relative versus absolute independence of some judicial systems. Uh, and uh, the transfer to other countries' jurisdiction of some of the businesses uh, was used as, as just a way to explain that those countries had more independent judicial system than elsewhere. Uh, therefore, the independence of judicial systems is not a theoretical, it is a practical issue as well. So today, as we discuss this essential and very critical issue, would like our discussion to be practical rather than theoretical. It is with pleasure that I'd like to give the floor for welcoming remarks to Yelena Borisenko. Yelena, please. <coughs> Thank you very much, Yuri. Thank you for inviting me to come here. Thank you for organizing this conference. Let me welcome distinguished panelists, uh, speakers, and all of the participants. I can see a lot of people, a lot of delegates uh, who have substantial influence on the future of uh, Russian and international legal profession. The subject uh, is really timely because the um, uh, well issue of access to justice, efficiency of uh, the justice system, all of those issues are pivotal, essential, and they call for effective solutions across the world. As we go about solving it, it is really difficult to overestimate the role of uh, lawyers. It is only powerful, independent, and professional lawyers that can ensure efficient adversary process and uh, therefore fair court judgments, uh, fair administration of justice, uh, fair examination of evidence, and consequently the quality which can effectively protect human rights. can uh, offer people access to a fair trial and uh, help them hope for a fair outcome of any, any trial. For us, the organizers of this forum, 
discussing uh, the legal profession, the role of defense attorneys, uh, their goals, the ways to improve the quality of their work is essential, like I said. Because uh, among other reasons, in Russia, we are on the verge of uh, changing the regulatory, legal regulatory system. Currently, the ministry is drafting a new approaches to high quality legal assistance and those changes are designed uh, to help implement article 42 of the constitution granting people the right to high quality legal assistance because of that, it is really important to know the opinion of academics, practitioners, Russian and international alike, uh, who can share their views and share experience of other countries as well. The strategy that will develop at the end of the day should comply with the principles uh, which will help us achieve the goals I mentioned earlier, independent, ethical and high quality work which uh, is done by lawyers is uh, if we achieve the goal the quality of justice will be high and our work successful <clears throat> I'm not going to take any more of your time, dear panelists. Uh, we have some great presentations on the agenda. Let me just uh, wish all of you to uh, spend the beautiful day we spent within these walls uh, fruitfully. Let me wish all of you to find the solutions here for which you actually came to this forum. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you, thank you so very much for your warm comments, and uh, we are going uh, to use them as a blessing for this conference. Let me give the floor to Vladimir Pligin now, who before he became a member of the Federal Duma, and he's been uh, in the Duma for more than 10 years. Before that, he worked as a lawyer. Uh, as chairman of a Duma Committee on Constitutional Legislation and State Building, is in charge of um, defense attorney-related legislation. We lawyers, we defense attorneys, uh, continue to see that he does care, that he's not indifferent, and we appreciate his efforts, including his most recent initiative. When Mr. Pligin and uh, Pavel Krasininikov, his colleague, um, a week ago, they submitted amendments to be introduced in the civil code, the amendments which are critical for Russian uh, defense bar uh, and for its independence, among other things. Dear Yelena, dear President of the Federal Chamber, it is a great pleasure to participate in this round table, which uh, focuses on fundamental issues. The uh, English version of the agenda says that our subject is strengthening independence of the judiciary. You know, both Russian and English names are very serious and have a lot of content. If we speak about uh, justice, uh, well, the principle of uh, separation of powers is implemented thoroughly. And separation of powers is a huge philosophical issue. Speaking about independence, well, I think that we should speak about dependence of justice, dependence of justice of uh, the fundamental values uh, that the justice should uh, be dependent on. And of course, those fundamental values include the Constitution. They also include uh, laws and statutes and rules and principles which are um, included in the law in which were mentioned by Yelena, the principles. Those are the principles related to freedom, to the feeling of freedom, to the feeling of fairness, 
And finally, we keep getting back to something that seems obvious, but that is included in Article 2 of the Constitution of Russia, the article which defines uh, human beings, uh, the freedoms and rights as the highest value. From the point of view of the defense born, from the point of view of the legal profession, uh, this heavy focus on Article 2 of Russia's Constitution is of paramount philosophical importance. Uh, we uh, just now heard a philosophical lecture by the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court. Uh, which has a lot of ideas about how philosophical stance of Dostoevsky can be translated in real life. And every time we speak about legal education, every time we discuss our work, we have to emphasize this dependence, this reliance on law only, on the feeling of fairness, on the uh, feeling of law, uh, which is uh, so important for justice. As for the system uh, or opinion of the Defense Board, thank you very much, Yuri. You mentioned something that is very important for us. Every time uh, we have discussion, we uh, focus heavily on the opinions and approaches of Russia's Defense Board and Russia's legal profession. And, uh, you know, every time we get together, we respond to uh, what uh, is discussed with a lot of thought. Last month, uh, after the Congress, uh, it did not take legislators a lot of time to take into account the criticism that you shared at the conference, and uh, you Russian lawyers can have a look at the federal bill changing uh, the approaches in the code and maintaining uh, the principles embodied in the law governing the defense bar. Independence uh, versus dependence on law and the emphasis on the reliance on law, dependence on law, um, are areas where defense bar can play a significant role. What I dislike uh, is uh, discussion. <laughs> Uh, when people complain that uh, legal profession and defense profession is underestimated, every professional, if uh, he's a real professional as opposed to making general comments, of course, uh, approaches and opinions of such a pro professional is taken in account, into account very seriously at trials and at higher courts because of the possibility to file a lot of appeals. And that shows that uh, the defense bar in Russia, lawyers in Russia play a significant role in implementing Article 2 of Russia's Constitution. I'd like to use this chance today, and we have said it before in other breakout groups and other sessions, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Federal Chamber once again and to its Academic Council for the ideas you expressed in your reports and your presentations, the presentations that you developed uh, to comment on human rights issues in different contexts, like um, when bail was discussed, pre-trial detention was discussed, etc. So uh, every time we get together at uh, roundtable discussions, conferences, every time we read your research, let us together develop our view of our common future. As for jurisdictional competition, uh, for the first time, <laughs> Before that issue was raised to the government level, it was raised at a conference by many lawyers, including Russian lawyers. <laughs> Every time I talk to you, mm -hmm. 
You know, instead of uh, you, I'd like to say we, because you cannot be a member of the Duma forever. This time comes to an end, and it is my ultimate desire to get back to your ranks as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you. Now we are waiting for you to come back, even though uh, we really like the way you work in your very important capacity. There's many more good lawyers, good defense attorneys, uh, and similarly good. Let me stop here. And give the floor to Konstantin Dobrini, who is deputy <coughs> chairman of the Federation Council committee for constitutional issues and judicial legislation. Like Vladimir Konstantin was never a defense attorney, but he was a practicing lawyer. I've known him forever. So the uh, issues of judicial independence and the issues of the defense bar is something that he has first-hand knowledge of. Uh, more good words about him. A lot of us uh, know him as, as a very caring, very passionate lawmaker is that very often he comes up with legislative initiatives designed to promote fairness and uh, justice and rule of law. Thank you very much, Constantine. You have the floor. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. And, uh, it is always very difficult to speak about after colleague Pligin. On the other hand, it's easy because he said it all. And uh, what is left to me is to say that I support him. Well, uh, anyway, I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Upper Chamber of Russian Parliament. Thank you for the uh, honor of inviting me and giving me a chance to share some of my ideas with you. We have been working together with the Defense Bar for a long time. When I say we, I mean the Council of Federation. We have had a working group for two and a half years, uh, and Mr. Pilipenko is the person who is behind it, and Evgeny Semenyako, who is unfortunately not with us, but I'd like to say hello to him. We can boast some successes uh, and uh, some good b bills which have been uh, discussed. Some of them have been discussed by my colleagues from the Federal Duma. Some of them will be discussed and reviewed in the future. And if adopted, they will remove some uh, legal absurdities which are still part of our legislation. When I was thinking about what I could possibly say to you today, this idea came to my mind. I uh, decided, I said to myself that you all have a rough idea of what you're going to talk about today and what you're going to tell each other. Why? Because you're professionals and you're honest. And I'm sure that what you are discussing during the breaks, you'll be able to repeat here because that is important. But there is something else. Uh, you know, what you say should be followed always by what you do. And Defense Bar is on the verge of global reform. I'm speaking about the implementation of the constitutional principle on high quality legal assistance. Let me wish you all. Uh, in this competition of those who apply law not to stand by. Because defense attorneys are very often modest. You don't want to be modest all the time. Please step in, uh, step into the competition. You know what is in common between defense attorneys and, and a man? Man is a warrior, a philosopher, and a wise man. So man exists in three different capacities. Uh, and uh, all of those capacities are represented here in this room. And uh, let us uh, do something specific uh, beyond the limits of pretty words. Uh, high quality legal assistance in Russia should be really implemented in real life. That is what I'd like to wish you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, if I may, I'd like to move on to our presentations. It is with great pleasure that I'd like to give the floor to the President of the Federal Chamber of Germany, Mr. Axel Tolgis. Uh, he's been coming to Russia for a long time, almost every year, uh, to this forum, among many other venues. It is a great honor for us. 
It's first international visit as the president of the Federal Chamber of Attorneys. I did to Germany upon the invitation of Mr. Fogus, and that is a great honor for me. So I would like to say a few truly lofty words, but they are as uh, lofty as they are sincere. I believe Mr. Fogus is an outstanding person because he's been leading the German Louis for eight years and all of us Russian attorneys working with our foreign friends have seen how this practice has changed in uh, Germany. It's a tremendous change and it's in a very sustainable position inside Germany as well as on the international level. Uh, the employer of Germany has served as a central attraction for many of its European equivalents. It's been a venue for many sincere and open discussions. As far as I know, Mr. Filkes this year is quitting his post of the chair of the chamber and of the Baron. In fact, it, I believe it's his last visit to Moscow in this capacity, but we do hope to continue our beautiful friendship long after that. Thank you, Mr. Filke. You have the floor. Deputy Minister of Justice Borisenko, colleagues and friends, it's my last visit here as president. I Hopefully it's not my last visit to St. Petersburg. I'm very happy to be here today, and it's great to, uh, honor to speak about this important legal as well as political topic. It's also good to meet so many friends, old friends, among the panelists and many good friends in the audience. Um, I think we never should forget that at jurists, as jurists, we are member of one family. And I think we should not underestimate the role of lawyers. What has been said, we should estimate the role of us lawyers um, in the capacity to shape society. And I think this is something that unifies us. Why are we talking about strengthening judicial independence today? The principle of judicial independence is inherent in the concept of the rule of law. Judicial independence in its normative form as well as in its actual day-to-day -day appearance in our courts is of fundamental importance for the functioning of democracy and not only democracy but also market economy. To an even higher degree, it is indispensable for the promotion of democracy and the rule of law in a country undergoing political and economic change. We the Germans know very well what we were talking about. Our state, in its present form, governed by the rule of law, is only 70 years old. Only recently we celebrated 9th of May. You all know what happened in my country until 1945. Things that also happened in our judiciary. By the way, in the judiciary, that was anything but independent and which produced terrifying judgments. Terrifying judgments handed down by terrifying ideologized and dependent jurists and lawyers. After World War II, however, our law and our strong and independent judiciary made possible the almost unbelievable, as we call it in German, Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle in West Germany and after the fall of the wall they assisted the transition in East Germany what, what's not that easy. You can imagine and you know that the transition from a totalitarian regime of the Nazis in our country but also from the one-party system of the German Democratic Republic to democracy and the rule of law was not finished with the introduction of a new constitution and new laws. Because human experience has shown also in Germany that power cannot be restricted without using force. There's only one authority which can make an entire society realize that your newly established order is now for real. And this authority is indisputably 
judiciary law, rule by law. It's not rule by law, but just rule of law and rule of just law. A strong, independent and functioning judiciary is always necessary linked with a strong and independent legal profession, so with our profession, mm. which holds a monopoly on legal advice and representation before the courts. This mon monopoly on legal advice and representation not only protects persons seeking justice from unqualified legal advice, it also serves in particular the efficiency of justice. A lawyer's talk is also to facilitate the work of a judge by preparing the material facts, by presenting the facts which are relevant for the judge's decision, by preparing and actively shaping the taking of evidence. The judge can thus come to a well-founded decision more quickly and with greater accuracy. Even if it is always for the judge to decide, the lawyer always contributes to the high quality and standard of a judgment. Many things have changed for the Russian judiciary since the concept of judicial reform of 1991. Mrs. Borisenko has already mentioned that. But surely, a lot remains to be done. According to a study in 57 countries on the correlation between the degree of judicial independence and a country's economic growth carried out on the basis of de facto and de euro, de euro indicators, Russia ranks seventh with regard to de jure, judicial independence, Germany, by the way, only comes on number 25. Regarding de facto independence, however, Russia, Russia scores, sorry to say, the last place but one, and also the position of Germany is not that fantastic. So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, lots to be done. Lots to be done in Russia, as well as in Germany. The German Association of Judges has been asking politicians for years to establish judicial self-regulation. We don't have this in our country. The Russian colleagues seem to be already way ahead in this respect. But why, dear colleagues, does a judge have to be independent? What is the purpose of the judicial independence. Just one thing in advance. A judge's independence is not just a privilege that comes with the profession. Also the right of lawyers are not rights of the lawyers, but are the rights and the privileges of our clients. On the contrary, judicial independence is a basic standard to conduct in accordance with the rule of law and fulfills an essential purpose in a state governed by the rule of law. The independence of the judge guarantees that judiciary is bound to statute law only. In his decision, a judge must be bound exclusively by law and statute. This principle is enshrined in the German Constitution in Article 20 and in the Article 120 of the Russian Constitution. In a modern democratic state governed by the rule of law, it is assumed that the legislative power and the executive power must, must keep in mind the well-being of the society, what I already mentioned with shaping of the society. This is exactly what does not apply, or very often not apply, to the judiciary. The court only serves the law and justice. To a judge, it must never be of interest which political party is in power, what the established political priorities are, who the acting head of the state is. This is important so that judges can be free of political reasons, party discipline, the will of the majority, and other outside influence. The principle of judicial independence ensures that the executive power 
and the legislative power are bound to statute law. Only if the acts of the administration can be reviewed regarding their legality by an independent and impartial court, the, ex the, ex uh, the, sorry, the administration will strive for excellency. Just the idea it's possible that what I do will be checked by independent courts forces and urges uh, the government to act lawfully. Only a strong and independent judicature will dare to review the laws adopted by the legislature and with regard to their constitutionality and will, if necessary, declare them null and void. I note what I am speaking about. The German Federal Constitutional Court dared so, in several instances over the last couple of years, much to the annoyance of some of our politicians. The citizens trust and the state government by the rule of law also depends on the fact whether their matters are decided by judges whom they can trust to be independent. Before independent judges who are guided only by the Constitution by statute and the law, citizens perceive themselves as subjects of a democratic state and not as a possessed object of state action. Mistrust regarding to the independence of judges in general can cause more damage than disappointed experience in an individual case. We have seen this in a lot of cases over the last year in Germany many judgments that, was not, that were not agreed by the idea and but what people were think, thinking about the case and about the sentence the court made. Where people lose their trust in the functioning of the rule of law, this may lead to people taking the law into their own hands, which is unwanted by society and ultimately to a general wariness of the state. Furthermore, the state structures as such is at risk. Therefore, judicial independency is nothing less than a principle that stabilizes the society, the government, and the state. Finally, the principle of judicial independence safeguards the integrity of the judiciary. Experience has shown that the third power, the so-called third power, the judiciary, has only few defenses against interference from the two other powers. The Constitutional Institute of Judicial Independence therefore also serves as a protection of the third power so that the latter can exercise in its functioning role and can be impartial and can dare against the other two powers. Why does this issue concern us as lawyers? Mm -hmm. And what can we do, we as lawyers, to strengthen judicial independence in our countries? Creating the structural preconditions for an independent judiciary, which means establishing the structures and the rules which protect the judges from interference and pressure and thus ensure an independent decision-making process is of considerable importance. It just must also be independent personally, as well as regarding the matter he is dealing with. He must be irremovable. He needs certain material and equipment in order to be able to perform his activity. Also a problem in my country. Over decades, over the last decade, sorry, over the last decades, we faced a lot of attacks against the equipment, the financial equipment of our judiciary. This is also an attempt to try, or it tries to uh, um, force the judiciary to come to quicker decisions, for example, to make an easy settlement. The decisions must be binding. The selection, promotion, and dismissal of judges must be subject to the rule of law principles and must proceed according to a fair procedure. Also, 
an example from Germany. In our constitutional court, we don't have any judge on the bench. We only have professors and judges. So it's not, it's, or more or less, it's unbelievable that the biggest party within our judiciary, 80%, we have 25,000 judges, but 160,000 lawyers. So we are the more majority within the judicial family, but we are not represented in our federal constitutional of court. So we cannot bring our experience as a lawyer, which is the experience of the practitioner, mm -hmm. into uh, the decision-making process of our court, something uh, where we have to work on and where the German federal bar is uh, eager to change the system. So a lot of to do in this uh, issue in Germany. We as lawyers must commit ourselves politically to the improvement of the framework conditions for judges. We not only have to fulfill our role as lawyers, working with the law, on the law, on the case, we also have to, we have a political role. We are part of the judiciary, therefore we have a right to be involved and have a say in matters regarding the future of the judiciary. Without strong and independent judges, our work will become obsolete. We can only achieve justice for our clowns, clouds if the judges we meet at court are highly qualified, independent, and committed to the highest ethical standard. A judicial decision by an independent judge is therefore a fundamental human right enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the European Convention of Human Rights. This is another reason why we lawyers demand that more of our lawyers' colleagues should be admitted to the judiciary, what I mentioned already. Today, the Russian judiciary almost exclusively, as far as I'm informed, recruits judges from the ranks of public prosecution, the police, the ministries, and judges' assistants. We believe, however, that also in Russia, lawyers' expertise on the judge benches will be helpful and will enrich the judiciary as a whole. The judiciary would benefit from the lawyer's special knowledge gained through experience. The immediate participation of former lawyers in the court's decision-making process will strengthen the judiciary's independence. Finally, we as lawyers can strengthen judicial independence by supporting a change of the political and legal culture in our respective countries, in uh, Russia as well as in Germany. The realization of rule of law principles largely depends on the behavior of the political actors. At this point, I should like to quote a former Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, said in his annual address to the Federal Assembly on the 17th February 1995, it is important to understand that a society's respect for the law will only develop when power starts respecting the law. I know what I'm talking about, as you know, perhaps, in Germany we have a so-called grand coalition at the moment. 80% of our parliamentarians are bound in the coalition of the Social Democratic Party and the Christ Democratic Party. And we as lawyers, we from the side of the German Federal Bar, have already realized what this means for our daily work. If you have very short political majorities, they ask for our assistance. They try to get us involved in the lawmaking process. They hear our arguments. In times when 80% of the parliament belong to one government, they say, well, this is the paper, this is the draft, and we, it just happened two weeks ago. You have 10 days time, check this draft, and whether you have any amendments or not, we will pass this through Parliament. So this is of the power, if the government, if the first power is too mighty. So thank you very much for your audience and thank you very much for having been invited to this fantastic event. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Filgis, uh, for a vivid presentation, for an exciting presentation. It's such a wonderful beginning of this conference. Uh, we Russian lawyers are not alone. It's not just we are not represented in the Constitutional Court. Our German colleagues are not represented there either. And now I'd like to give the floor for another great man. I'm sorry for speaking so highly of him. The agenda says uh, the floor is given to Vice President of Moscow Chamber, but he's also Vice President of the Federal Chamber. But all those positions uh, actually mean next to nothing. Henry Resnick, uh, who is a famous, eloquent speaker, master of form and master of idea. Henry, it is with pleasure that I give you the floor. Thank you, Yuri, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the subject on the agenda is judiciary independence. I'd like to make one emphasis, if I may uh, carry on uh, with something which my colleague rightly said. Judicial independence is not the ultimate goal, because the independence must ensure unbiased, uh, fair trial of cases by courts, both civil cases and criminal cases. The principle of independence uh, has uh, more impact on the court than the structure of the court itself. If you look uh, at the Constitution and remember ongoing complaints about how two different branches of power, executive and legislative, are in disbalance uh, in the Constitution, and the executive uh, power has um, many more advantages. Our republic is not just a presidential, it's a super presidential republic, and many say that this balance should change. But as for the judiciary branch, let me uh, say that uh, our Constitution <coughs> establishes uh, independence of the judiciary in compliance with all possible international standards. So if uh, you look at the legislation and decide to figure out what you can improve in the legislation to make judicial independence better, you're unlikely to find anything, any weakness, any loophole. Moreover, our Supreme Court uh, stood up for this budgetary line funding courts. And by the way, that uh, well, they brought this case against the Ministry of Finance. They won the case. So we have the Judicial Department now, which is funded appropriately. And uh, remuneration our judges receive is quite OK. This is what I would like to focus on, this independence as a component of the separation of powers, which, let me repeat, is incorporated in the Constitution quite adequately. So that separation of powers should ensure unbiased and a fair review of the cases. I would like to speak about criminal justice system, something that is close to my heart. And as I speak, uh, I'll try to be more specific in reviewing the situation, in reviewing the status quo there, and uh, speaking uh, about uh, something that no one disagrees with, with, something that our politicians accept. Uh, that is uh, called this. this phenomenon is referred to as prosecutorial trend. Prosecutorial trend was something uh, that combination of words used first by uh, Dmitry Medvedev at the time he was president of Russia, and then it was repeated by many famous politicians. Let me speak about something very, very important. Until very recently, 
there were many complaints coming from uh, defense board. Those complaints were rebutted by our procedural opponents, and we said, we spoke uh, about virtual absence of acquittals in the professional court at bench trials, uh, and I can give you uh, impressive statistics. Uh, like uh, practically all uh, pre-trial detention motions issued by investigators are granted by the court, 92%. 82% of motions on uh, conducting investigative activities related to searches and other limitation of freedom are also invariably granted by the courts. But this is what I'd like to say, dear colleagues. Uh, well, um, ours uh, is uh, a civil code uh, system, what is sometimes referred to as a continental system. It was uh, regulated by Napoleon law. What does it mean? It means that pretrial investigation <clears throat> is based on inquisitorial principles. <clears throat> the adversarial approach is granted at trial during court examination and somehow. Uh, well, justice is administered, justice process uh, cannot be perfect, but we hear nothing about prosecutorial trend in European countries. I'll try to be as specific as I can today, <laughs> because uh, we mostly have members of the defense board, and every time we have a dispute, a disagreement, or we dispute or disagree in absentia, because prosecutors very often attend defense attorneys' events and vice versa. The opposite is true. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let me go back to this uh, astonishingly small uh, percentage of acquittals. At the time when uh, criminal acquittals uh, were much higher, up to 30%, uh, in uh, the Tsarist Russia, there were up to 40% of acquittals. Just like in many European countries, uh, the acquittal statistics are very impressive. In the uh, in 1920s, uh, the number of acquittals was at times as high as 25%. And now, let me tell you uh, that uh, there is no other rule of law civilized country uh, where uh, well, acquittals exceed five. Why? And our opponents use it as an argument. Why is it so that European countries and North America, the United States, and the Canada, I'm not speaking about uh, common law countries, I'm not speaking about the United States where the adversarial process uh, is observed even at the pretrial investigation stage. So let me say that. In European countries, they have power uh, pre-trial screening or filtering. There are filtering, uh, preventing weak cases from coming to courts where evidence is underdeveloped, where evidence is not sufficient. European prosecutors uh, uh, are very often perceived as part of the judiciary because of that screening, because of that filtering. Let me give you an analogy. Coney uh, uh, used to speak about prosecutor slash judge. Prosecutors are very, very cautious about the cases they admit. They screen out, filter out uh, cases with weak evidence. Very often they dismiss the cases on their own. So this filtering, which they do, 
on their own. Leads to the situation where 95% of criminal cases end up in a plea bargain. Or in, in, in uh, judgments which are made prior to the trial, outside of the trial, or which do not use the prison penalty. Our opponents use that, and they say we should not have acquittals. Why? Because we, too, have a powerful filter mounted by investigators and prosecutors, because our prosecutors have this uh, function, responsibility to oversee the investigative process. We can uh, debate on uh, the scope of powers, but the statistics, the values, uh, do not corroborate that argument. What goes on in our system? This filtering process, and I'm speaking about criminal cases now, happens before they are formally initiated. Only 20% of complaints, criminal complaints, <clears throat> end up in formal, in formal criminal commencement. So 80% is filtered out. What happens next? And what happens next is really very interesting, very captivating, unlike what our opponents say. Maybe not all of them read statistics uh, or they choose to hush it up. But regretfully, uh, I have to admit, I listen to a lot of my colleagues and uh, what my colleagues say sounds very vague, and I've never heard uh, defense attorneys uh, using uh, some hard facts when we curse prosecutorial trends. So uh, they say that the investigators, when they conduct investigation, they filter out the cases. They, they filter them out, and they do not <laughs> Let weak uh, cases uh, get to trial, get to the court, where the guilt of defendants is not proven. It is only 20% uh, of the criminal cases which are formally initiated are uh, dismissed at the pre-trial investigation stage, just 2%. The only filter that uh, is really working, and we have to welcome that, but it, it, it's not the dismissal of the case by the investigator for rehabilitating circumstances. No. Uh, it is pre-trial settlement, settlement between the victim and the defendant. It is an extremely important system. Uh, it exists in the West as well, and up to 50%, 5-0% of the case end up in a pretrial settlement, not just in, in my country. Uh, I've looked at what's going on in post-Soviet countries. In Kazakhstan, imagine up to 70%, 7-0% of the cases end up in peaceful settlement. Like I said, 2% of the cases are dismissed. What percentage is dismissed for rehabilitating circumstances? That is a neglectable value. They're almost non-phenomenal, non some really you know, parts of 1%. And I'm responsible for what I say. Now what happens next? We have the prosecutor who is the only person who has the authority for the judgment of guilt pronouncement. And in fact, the investigation here is called the uh, preliminary investigation. So the investigation prepares the evidence and the materials to ensure that the prosecutor agrees with the corroboration of the guilt and then goes further to court. So I should state that prosecutors tend to return back the cases to the investigators. Usually, it's about 
of cases that have this uh, fortune. Now, what happens next to them? They are given back to the investigators. So out of these 2% of cases, it's about 0.9% of 2% are terminated. The rest goes on and off to court. Now, why am I saying all of this? Further, this reaches the court stage. Now, perhaps not everyone knows this, but imagine that 90% of convicts admit their guilt using a special procedure for that or not, but altogether this figure is 90%. So out of 1,200,000 uh, convicts, including the um, collective ones, about 10%, do not admit their guilt. So these are the 10% where our professional courts essentially do not arrive at any acquittals. So taking the calculations from here, it gets to be about 0.5%. Now, it is uh, from 15 to 23%, so altogether about 20% percent of acquittals that we get in the uh, trial by jury. Now, 25 percent, if we get to calculating it, or rather 25,000 persons, if you take the standard of proof and corroboration that's available at the trial by jury, are sentenced with no grounds for proving their guilt, for corroborating it. Now, how did it go about it in Germany, in Canada, in the Netherlands, in Netherlands, in Great Britain? What is the percentage there out of these 5% that go to courts because they do not admit their guilt where we have the adversarial process then in place. So up to 50%, this figure is, right? So that's the way we should approach the comparison. So it turns out that 50% of these cases make 5% of the overall number of them. So I hope I've been able to rely on some statistics to ground the presence of this bias towards the judgment of guilt. Now, if you take the miserable acquittals, by the professional courts, there about half of them are, in fact, cancelled, whereby we have an interesting trend in place as well. The number one third of them is where it has been going down by, uh, for the past 10 years, whereas the reversing of judgments of guilt has at all times been going down in statistics. Now, dear colleagues and dear opponents, if I have any here, I can hereby state that we are entering the practical stage whereby, apart from a discussion which we've been having on, on the bias towards judgments of guilt and the rest of it, from here we can see two paths forward to fight against this bias towards the judgment of guilt. In the West, there are two models available with the continental system of law again. Uh, the first option is the figure of the court investigator, and the other one are the prosecutors, the prosecutors who essentially carry out this filtering, and this role is attributed to them. Recently, 
at the hearings of the civic initiative organization, we had a very substantive conceptual address from Vyacheslav Smirnov, and he had a proposal introducing the court investigator, the, in, the investigation judge, and not the court investigator, because in France, for instance, where this position has a long-standing history and they're much attached to it, so apart from the court investigator, there was introduced the position of the judge for freedom of prison. So this means that we cannot tolerate it when one subject of the criminal case is there to evaluate the justice and validity of the decisions he has personally taken. We have the investigator who considers the solicitation from the lawyers and the pre-trial stage. And the statistics demonstrate that in compliance with Article 217, in 90% of cases, the investigator rejects the uh, solicitation on the pre-trial investigation. So the proposal to introduce this position, this role of the investigation judge, I believe is preferable. It's a new role, and this role can be there to address a number of very important goals. In the first place, this role is there to ensure the quick consideration of reports of illicit methods of investigation. And in fact, I'm somewhat ashamed of it. Uh, and it's a shame I experienced before my foreign colleagues in his time. Stepashin, who used to be the Minister of Interior, who was a very outspoken and sincere person, he said, we have a torture, like or torture-based investigation. Um, well, I can see the state of things is much milder now, but this is only the cap of the iceberg. We continuously encounter the illicit uh, methods of carrying out the investigation when the uh, suspect is forced into certain uh, things. Now, who is this reported to? The investigator, the same investigator. So all of this gets off to the back burner, and there is then further no longer a possibility to prove it. Now, we have the judge taken taking the resolution on the way to penalize the uh, convict and distinguish this role from the judge who is, in the, in, is um, considering the case. Because Oftentimes, we also have a major prince of the combination of the two functions when it comes to the judge considering the essence of the case. Most often, this uh, takes place in, co in courts with a smaller number of members and staff than the formation of court evidence. Bits. Uh, we have the investigator investigating uh, that is finding the relevant answers, and this already goes as proof. And also there is litigation between um, the two sides of any process. Next, we do have a hope whereby, like our prosecutor says now, prosecutors are lacking the authority now. And there is a hope they will be carrying out these functions and indeed will be able to ensure some filtering. Well, this makes me doubt tremendously because we have a very bad legacy here and it's difficult to overcome because we have our legal system uh, based on uh, too much inertia. In fact, the court was 
pretty much on the part with the prosecutors and investigators and judges. They all had the same uh, mission to find the objective truth, you know, the complex and comprehensive investigation of the material of any of a case. I'm looking around here and I'm seeing a lot of attorneys here who practiced back in the Soviet times and the times we uh, have discussions and they are nostalgic about the specific institution which no country in the world knew of. That is directing the cases for additional investigation due to the lack of substantial evidence, uh, due to their being incomplete, literally. So acquittals were considered uh, as a shame of a prosecutor or an investigator. So in the Soviet times, acquittals were uh, never the end of the investigation. But um, if I have another two minutes, I will continue, if I may. You see, I'm judging from your faces. I'm, I'm seeing no one is talking to one another, but I understand um, it's a little difficult to fall asleep when I'm speaking. And that must be the reason for everyone keeping so quiet. So that was not the job and the mission of our prosecutors. It was that of the judges. But you see, judges are also human beings, you know, and not all of them are monsters or sadists. When you have a completely uncorroborated proposition of guilt, uh, additional investigation was carried out, and that, in fact, was the dead end of a case. Now, the way the prosecutors act uh, today shows that the miserable uh, number of cases, 2% of cases, are initially redirected for further investigation with additional work being done on them, and then they again end up in court. So I do hope that our prosecutor will become the type of the prosecutor, like his colleagues in Canada or in Europe, but there isn't much hope for it. Now, why am I stressing it? Why is it so that in professional courts we almost never come across acquittals. Now, in trial by jury, it's 20% of cases. In fact, there's been some calculations, and the way it works out is as follows. If you take the standard, and the trial by jury is essentially dealing with people who are dumb and who are very simple, so the chair instructs them as follows, in case of doubts, you have to rely on the Constitution and to interpret the uh, facts in the interest of the conduct. So that's exactly what they are doing. Now, what do our professional judges do? If you take the standard 20%, you will see that annually 20 5,000 convicts in this country. You know, it's a big country. They could have calculated it for hundreds of thousands, but I can give you the exact figure. 25,000 people this would be if we rely on the standard of proof and corroboration by the trial of jury. Now, why don't the professional courts uh, come to acquittals? The former deputy prosecutor of the Tverskoy district of the city of Moscow said, I hate quoting, but this one I will quote, judges consider themselves as soldiers who are serving at the front lines fighting the crime. The judge is never going to end up with an acquittal without having a 100% um, of evidence proving uh, that there is no guilt in place. If he has a minor suspicion of the guilt, the judge will consider the person guilty, even if this does not match the evidence. This is beautifully formulated. The assumption of innocence only work, works when the unproven guilt is made equal to the proven innocence. Now, why is it 50% in Germany, in Great Britain, in Canada, that end up in acquittals? 
out of the number of cases when there is a lack of uh, clarity, when in fact it is not obvious whether or not the person is guilty or not. Because, let me reiterate this again, in the criminal process, as in all human cases, they use evidence, and this evidence is never entirely and completely reliable. This evidence is imperfect in its nature. Mistakes are inherent in them because it's the witness reports the witness evidence. It's not syllogisms of Aristotle. And that's exactly why the assumption of innocence works exactly because we need to understand that even with the most unbiased, impartial, objective investigation, the courts never ultimately concludes or can conclude whether or not the person is guilty or not at all. And if you have a doubt, you always need to interpret it for the, in the interest and for the sake of the assumed innocence. So at the latest meeting of the bar, we adopted the resolution in protection of uh, the trial by jury. 600 cases a month is the number of uh, the trial by jury for the whole country. And in fact, our law enforcement authorities dream of having a chance to redirect the cases for further additional investigation. So now President Putin has commissioned the um, expansion of the jurisdiction of uh, the trial by jury in its classical version in splitting the traditional standard court from the people's popular court. Now, the fact that the trial by jury is incapable of, that the jury are incapable of understanding the case, well, in fact, the acquittals by the jury in the cases where they can hardly be supportive and that have been removed from the capacity of the trial by jury can be split as follows is 20% of bribery related cases and in fact these ended up in acquittals why because oftentimes the jury identified the provocation and including 2% uh, of pedophilic um, intentions because one of the deputies said we should withdraw cases on pedophiles from uh, trials by jury because the jury are siding with pedophiles. Well, quote, we should in every way support this concept that pretty much was proposed as a law uh, bill on introducing the investigation judge and on expansion of uh, the jury uh, jurisdiction. Uh, very deep, very impressive presentation. For the first time, I uh, asked myself what I should feel now, white or a depression, and do we, Russian defense attorneys, go back uh, to work? Uh, but because I know that uh, you are quite a friendly person, I, I, I'd like to ask you question, this question after the conference. And now Yelena Brisenko asked to speak, to make a couple of comments. And as, of course, I said yes. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, like it was very difficult for Constantine to speak after Vladimir Plegin. Uh, similarly, it is very dangerous uh, to speak after Henry Resnick, let alone disagree with him, because his reputation uh, is perfect, it's absolute, unconditional in our community. 
But I have a mixed feeling today. Normally, at bigger events attended by law enforcement colleagues, uh, when I see a lot of law enforcement people, I invariably protect and defend. Uh, defense attorneys, I take their side, I use a lot of practical examples showing how defense attorneys are useful and how important uh, their role in the administration of justice uh, important, is important. Now, after I listened to Henry Resnick, uh, who uh, quite justifiably criticized a lot of things, I'd like to slightly disagree with uh, my own profession and say that uh, the role of defense attorneys in the statistics that were quoted uh, can be seen. Some role is played by defense attorneys. Uh, I know uh, we have inquisitorial uh, proceedings, inquisitorial uh, investigation. But some time ago, and I know it from the documents uh, that are submitted to me, what is sometimes used is inquisitorial defense attorneys, because uh, some of them, especially those um, who are not high quality people, or sometimes they do it intentionally, what they do, they do not leave the court uh, any freedom to uh, return fair verdicts. So the only thing that is left for the court is to return a verdict which is not uh, fair, which is not supported by the procedure codes and the Constitution, because in adversarial proceedings, defense attorneys do nothing to defend their clients. And sometimes uh, they uh, do something uh, that, you know, kills the client, I mean, that results in the client losing their cases. Such examples are numerous, and such examples were not only quoted by judges or prosecutors, many of them were quoted by defense attorneys. In a multi-defendant case, for example, where more than one defense attorney is involved, a good defense attorney can see how unprofessional or unethical co- uh, defenders are and, you know our discussion as you see is quite open now we are not trying to hide most sensitive issues from our international colleagues we openly speak about uh, you know some diseases uh, that our system is infested with for the defense bar what is really very important is to improve uh, their internal corporate standard and have every member of the defense bar comply with the standard uh, if uh, courts could see uncomfortable and very professional defense attorneys then the statistics could be better I can see in this room some of the people who can boast quite a number of acquittals. And I know that uh, those acquittals uh, were issued after very hard, meticulous uh, work done by uh, the defense attorney who worked hard to obtain the evidence and present the evidence. Uh, and um, here I'd like to thank the Federal Chamber wholeheartedly for the help they uh, give us to draft a new bill on uh, defense attorneys' requests and motions, because such requests uh, should be more professional, more easily implementable and enforceable, because that is important. And if our plans become a reality and if they are passed in the law, it is very important to have defense attorneys use the opportunities they have. Yes, I realize that the criminal justice system should uh, be improved at all stages. Uh, prosecutorial oversight, investigation, and the courts, but defense work should also improve. 
Why? Because our ultimate goals may only be achieved uh, if all elements of the justice system uh, work appropriately. You cannot uh, have one element working beautifully and other elements dysfunctional. I'd like to apologize, even though I would like to stay uh, till the end of the conference, but because I'm responsible for uh, some organizational and logistical issues, I have to leave. And uh, I hope uh, to be able to discuss all of the conclusions and all of the material later. And so also everything is recorded here. So I know I'll have another chance. Thank you all very much and I'd like to thank um, the distinguished guests including uh, colleagues from other countries uh, who are interested enough to have come here to take part in this uh, very important discussion. Before you go, Yelena, just one comment. Uh, in the uh, conviction can the judge say that the defendant was found guilty uh, because his case was ruined by defense attorneys? Uh, no, the judge will not write it as justification for the conviction, but let me assure you that that is what judges think very often. I agree. I don't disagree. Thank you. Uh, well, we seem to have a very lively discussion. Thank you, Yelena, and goodbye. Unfortunately, we have to continue without you. I, too, uh, would like to share some comments after your presentation, Henry, but I'll save it till our next meeting at the Ministry of Justice, where we draft this bill Yelena mentioned and many other bills designed to strengthen the Russian Defense Board. I would like to give the floor to our next guest whom we met uh, in the city of St. Petersburg at a symposium on the rule of law chaired by the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court. We're happy that Mr. Filkinot uh, the previous uh, chairman of uh, ABA is here with us. When I met with Mr. Hubbard, who now chairs the ABA, American Bar Association, he assured me that if he couldn't come himself, uh, he will ask his representative to come. So Mr. Silkinant is with us. And now I'm thinking about what we can do. Uh, you know, the Federal Chamber has been invited to come to Chicago in, in June. So probably we'll have to send our representative as well instead of coming on my own. Mr. Silken, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, President Pilipinko for inviting me to participate in this important conference. The Federal Chamber is a, an outstanding organization, and I'm very flattered uh, to be included in your discussion today. I first came to St. Petersburg almost 50 years ago as a student, uh, and it's wonderful to see uh, how the city has blossomed uh, since then. Many things have changed, uh, but the best parts of the city uh, are as beautiful as ever. Our focus here today is to consider methods that have been used or that might be used uh, by a bar organization to increase the independence of the judiciary and to better ensure the proper functioning of the adversarial system. I believe that even though these could easily be thought of as two separate issues, they are never, nevertheless closely related. And as I will discuss in a few minutes, I believe that strengthening the adversarial system, particularly by improving the knowledge, competency, and advocacy skills of lawyers who practice before the courts is actually one method for promoting greater judicial independence. Although there are some real differences among our organizations and legal systems, the leaders of the American Bar Association, the Federal Bar Association of the, Rebel, of the Russian Federation, and other national bar associations represented here today share the same fundamental mandate and mission, to strengthen 
and support the legal profession, to secure and defend the rule of law, to protect the rights of individuals and organizations, and to require that justice not only be done, but also be seen to be done. This last imperative that justice most <coughs> must both be done and be seen to be done can only be achieved if the judiciary is not only independent in fact, but also broadly perceived and trusted by the citizens to be independent. And the establishment of such a ju judiciary is not only necessary to ensure the proper dispensation of justice, it's also critical to any country that aspires to the rule of law and the enormous economic benefits and development that the rule of law brings. With specific regard to economic benefits, I'd like to make reference to a study done in 2005 by a group of World Bank economists. Their study was called Where the Wealth of Nations Is. In that study, these economists analyzed the wealth of 120 developing and developed countries, and they came to a conclusion that was quite likely surprising to the economists, but not so surprising to the legal profession. These economists assessed the relative percentage of a country's wealth that was being contributed by three fundamental factors. Its natural resource endowment, its physically produced capital, and finally, its intel, uh, intangible capital. The intangible capital factor was further subdivided into two basic components. One, human capital, which can be thought of as the degree of education of its population, and second, the quality of formal and informal institutions broadly defined as the rule of law and good government. The study concluded that the preponderant form of wealth worldwide is actually intangible capital. That is, human capital measured through schooling years per capita, per capita plus the rule of law. And that these two factors account for nearly 90% of the variations among countries in the wealth contributed by intangible capital. And they also found that the rule of law was actually a far greater contributor to national wealth and economic diversification than, than the education level of the citizens, although obviously that education level was still a highly important factor. The study strongly suggests that rich countries are largely rich not because of the skills of their populations, but also, and maybe more importantly, because of the quality of the institutions, that is, rule of law and government, that characterize the environment for economic activity. From this, I think the policy lessons are clear. A country that desires to achieve a growing, diversified, and resilient economy is one that must, as really one of its highest priorities, ensure the proper functioning of its justice system. And I think this ultimately comes down to the basic notions of trust and risk. The more trust that people have in their public institutions, particularly their legal and judicial institutions, the less risk they will perceive when deciding whether to invest or engage in economic activity. And the lower the perception of risk, the greater likelihood that the decision will be positive. This is why countries have, uh, that have a relatively high degree of rule of law enjoy such significant levels of both foreign and direct uh, inward investment. Re returning to the specific uh, topic of this focus of this conference, I think we need to ask what steps might a bar organization take to achieve or maintain a high level of trust in the judicial system. Here I see two distinct but related sets of activities. First, I think a bar organization must take concrete steps that are likely to increase both the reality and the perception that the courts apply the law in an objective, unbiased, and wholly independent manner. And second, I believe that a bar organization must actively take steps to better ensure that the courts are accessible to all who may have a need to bring a matter before the courts. With regard to the first set of activities, I believe that a bar organization must do whatever it can to ensure that there exists a very well-considered, highly detailed, comprehensive, and truly enforceable set of rules governing judicial conduct. 
and a bar organization must engage in substantial, substantial continuing legal education activity. It must ensure that all its members are well trained on the rules of judicial conduct, the relevant case law, and applicable procedures so lawyers are better positioned to identify and take action against potential instances of judicial misconduct. I also believe that a bar organization must ensure, and this is through a robust program of continuing legal education, that its members are skilled and competent advocates for their clients. A judge who is subject to any type of influence, <coughs> including from another judge, will likely find it much harder to decide a case wrongly if advocates have, have presented the case in a truly competent manner. So part of a bar's continuing legal education program must be dedicated to training, particularly practical clinical training, in the adversarial method. This relates back to the point I made at the beginning of my remarks, strengthening the adversarial system, particularly by improving the knowledge, competency, and practical advocacy skills of lawyers who practice before the courts is actually a method for promoting greater judicial independence. A second set of important bar or organization activities has the objective of making the courts more accessible. This is an issue with which I've had uh, personal experience in the U.S., and I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that we did during my term as president of the ABA. Any system of courts uh, and legal professionals are, uh, as a, um, a practical matter, where, are, where the, the inaccessible uh, to a significant percentage of people is one that will inspire only a modest amount of trust in that system. When people lack access, to properly trained legal professionals, they are far more likely to be, and perceive themselves to be, subjected to unfair or unjust outcomes. Th with this in mind, when I began, began my term as president of the ABA, I made it one of our basic priorities to focus on improving the accessibility of legal representation to those who need it. And my successor, uh, as the current president of the ABA, has also focused on these issues. My first action as ABA president was to create the ABA's Legal Access Job Corps, which works to improve the fit between the needs of our profession and the needs of our society. The purpose of the Legal Access Job Corps um, is to address the apparent paradox created by the large number of law graduates who are unable to find jobs and training as lawyers and the large number of persons who are in need of a lawyer but cannot afford one or in sparsely populated areas cannot find one. Traditionally, these two issues have been considered uh, separate problems. The Legal Access Job Corps is an innovation aimed at addressing them as one problem instead of considering them as separate silos. In 2013, only one legal aid attorney was available for every 6,400 low-income people in the United States. That's really unacceptable, and there are significant geographic regions of our country where the lawyer population is scant or non-existent, and where the local population, for, for all practical purposes, does not have timely or close geographic access to a lawyer. The New York Times reported that when a lawyer in Bennett County, South Dakota, retired after 64 years in practice, there was not one attorney to take his place in the area. The closest working attorney lived 190 kilometers away. In other parts of the country, many young lawyers are looking for work. One attorney in California posted an ad on the internet saying, quite frankly, I am quite desperate and willing to learn and dedicate myself to any area of the law. The Legal Access Job Corps um, is looking at the full range of programs now in place from rural outreach programs and nonprofit fellowships to modest means programs and incubators that help struggling lawyers meet the legal needs of the underserved. And what we have seen is really uh, tremendously encouraging. An example that may be particularly interesting for our colleagues from the Federal Chamber comes from the sparsely populated state of South Dakota. In that state, legislation was successfully passed in support 
of a program to recruit young lawyers to work in the rural areas of the state where sufficient lawyer coverage does not exist. The program is now up and running with young lawyers from all across the United States now looking to help uh, in that program and to participate. And this is just one example of a bar organization coming up with a creative response to this difficult issue. But there are many others. And it's not just bar organizations. It's law firms, uh, law schools, bar foundations, other stakeholders, often in partnership with each other, that are working to solve this problem. And we know that the American Bar Association can't solve this problem. We know that the American Bar Association can't solve We are trying to find win-win solutions that benefit everyone. Through the ABA's Legal Access Job Corps, we are providing financial grants to help nurture uh, Извините, что-то случилось с синхронным переводом. Нужно поправить, если можно. Uh, говорят, что перешли на второй канал. Пожалуйста, Сергей. Опять на первом канале, извините. We're working ways to, to get young lawyers to open new avenues to justice through programs that also give them practical experience. During the past year, these financial grants from the ABA have helped st state and local incubator programs from California and Vermont to New Orleans and Detroit. The ne Nebraska State Bar received a Legal Access Job Corps grant for a project to enhance access to lawyers in rural areas by facilitating summer clerkships for law students who will be placed with rural law firms, gaining experience and a sense of life in less populated areas. A, gr a similar grant to the Detroit Mercy School of Law provides support for new law graduates who are beginning a solo or small firm practice and also demonstrate a commitment to serving low and moderate income individuals. The ABA has also recently undertaken two other uh, important and related efforts with respect to what the ABA is doing for our nation's law graduates and access to justice. First is the report of the ABA Task Force on the Future of Legal Education. This task force was charged with making recommendations to the ABA on how the association, law schools, and other groups and organizations can take concrete steps to address issues concerning the economics of the legal education and the delivery of that education. The report calls for more experimentation and innovation in law schools and an expansion of opportunities for the delivery of legal services. It also called for a close look at the financial model prevalent in law schools, a proposal that resulted in the formation of our task force on the finance of legal education. That task force is charged with looking at the cost of legal education for students, the financing of law schools, student loans, and educational debt, all of those important issues in the United States. It's also considering current practices of law schools regarding the use of merit scholarships, tuition discounting, and need-based aid. The U.S. legal system is widely admired, I think, around the world, but we in the legal profession must work to ensure that the system remains strong and viable to meet the evolving needs, the changing needs of our clients and of society in general in a, a globalized world. My guess is that many of the issues that exist for our colleagues, many of those same issues exist for our colleagues here in Russia and in other countries around the world. Lawyers and bar organizations play a critically important role in strengthening the rule of law and supporting judicial independence. That should be a role that all of us are proud to play. And thank you for very much for allowing me to share these ideas with you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Silkina. Thank you for your substantive address and the major conclusion uh, there is that being resourceful is 
uh, something that's very necessary to all of us in this, in this profession, to the managers of legal litigation, to the leaders of bar associations and other institutions, even during this conference, we've tried to be resourceful to find the uh, channel where your presentation was interpreted. Now, Evgeny Semenyako is our next speaker, and this Kirill is another outstanding person here, the first president of the Federal Chamber of Attorneys. He shaped our attorney service over the past 12 years. Unfortunately, however, he isn't with us today. He sends his best regards to all of you. And our next speaker is Paul Albert Evans. Like Mr. Filgus, I have a feeling he hasn't missed a single forum. As the Russian attorneys have worked very extensively with him when he chaired the National Council of Attorneys in France and the Bar Association in Paris, uh, he'll be speaking in French. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief, because a lot has already been said prior to my presentation. In fact, I would like to, in the first place, note the joy and the pleasure I feel on being back to St. Petersburg, and I would like to again stress the tradition of the Russian French friendship and the friendship in between the lawyers and the attorneys in France and in Russia. Mr. President, you mentioned Mr. Semenyako. Well, I'm really sorry to see that he is not working here with us. He's a grand, great friend of mine, so please do send him my very best regards. I'll be very brief. And now, as to the independence of the judicial system, in fact, all the principles of the independent judiciary have been pretty much listed here by the previous speakers. I want to just share one of the views on this with you. Now, we ought to know that in every country of the world, the state is not tremendously fond of attorneys and lawyers in Napoleon. Who has left a hardly pleasant uh, print in this country has said the tongue should be cut off of all the attorneys. And he said the same thing about the judges. And that's natural. It's only natural because such is our. Uh, profession. It's very demanding. It's extremely critical. It takes a lot of resolution and decisiveness. I loved the address of Mr. Resnik who was uh, talking about a bias in the Russian law enforcement system, the bias towards the judgment of guilt. And we cannot hope to be liked by everyone, and I want to tell everyone, and the Russian colleagues as well, we don't have to be popular with everyone and to be liked by everyone. We need to make sure we are respected, because we are an indispensable constituent of the rule of law. In any state of the world, we're not after love. We ought to ensure respect for ourselves. And this is the kind of battle we're waging permanently in all the country, countries. You know, in 2015, in his April before the Secretary General of the Council of Europe said that over one third of the states that are members of the Council of Europe do not comply with the standards of the independence of the judiciary. That's one third of the countries, which means it's not only us fighting in this field, you know, that in the contemporary world, fighting against terrorism all over the place is a pretext 
for passing the laws that would restrict freedoms, and in the first place, the freedoms of attorneys and of lawyers. And this is what lawyers experience in many countries. We've talked about the independence, independence of the judiciary, which is the key pillar. It largely depends on their education, on their status, and on how protected they are in their turn. We have talked about the independence of the prosecutors. That's no less important, and also depends on their status on their education, as well as on how protected they are from the interference of the state. This is a statement in the international conventions, and this law enforcement practice is stipulated by the European Court. So what are things like when it comes to the independence of lawyers? In fact, the independence of lawyers or attorneys is indispensable, is a prerequisite to a state governed by the rule of law in order to counter the challenges. And this is truly about professional ethics. We do not consider ourselves independent. If we do not fully abide by all our ethical principles, how can we then ensure our independence? In the first place, by and through our professional associations, our attorney chambers have to freely be formed and the leaders of these lawyers, uh, associations and parties should be elected without any interference of the state. If we create such professional unions, it really is important that the uh, bars or chambers ensure the independence of the members, that they ensure the regulating to the access to the profession so that they can act as consultative bodies and share their opinions on who can be a lawyer, an attorney, and uh, so that they take the decisions on how these should be trained and dedicated. This indeed is the responsibility of our professional organizations. Which is critical to guarantee the ethics in our profession and access to our profession. Part of our professional ethics is a personal independence of the attorney, a personal independence with regard to his client, personal independence in terms of the economic and political. We need to make sure we know how to defend our views, and we've got to be impartial and entirely resolute when it comes to our professional discipline. If we see those that are engaged in malpractices, I did promise to be brief. So I just want to draw your attention to important aspects we're all fighting for. All the bar associations are into this, and I know you are no exception that's fighting for the freedom of expression of lawyers and courts and outside the courts. In France, the European Court of um, Human Rights uh, was speaking of limiting uh, the freedom of expression of lawyers in the media. And in fact, indeed, we ought to be sure we work for this, um, because in fact, this accusation was grounded. 
Besides, we ought to protect our professional secret. In a state governed by the rule of law, we need to make sure anyone can talk to his lawyer and to speak his mind and to share everything, being sure that it's not going to be used again against him. The professional confidentiality of the lawyers should be guaranteed, you know. It is an issue yeah, all of uh, the world, and you know that the searches of the lawyers' offices and the bugging of telephone lines used by the lawyers uh, seizing email you know, accounts um, are measures that are restricted in all the countries, we ought to be sure that the confidentiality of practice and the professional secret is there instilled because it is an indispensable prerequisite for our dealing with our clients. We really have to fight for this unanimously and firmly because if we are not firm enough, no one will do this for us. And then we can slide from being a democratic uh, state into a dictatorship, their fellows, their friends, their lawyers representing the entire world, all of us here No, the truth. We know lawyers and attorneys are indispensable for a real rule of law, so let us be sure we do what it takes together to ensure that the law is free, independent, um, has no ignoring the fact that we are not always loved by everyone. In fact, it's a very nice formula of success. Don't seek love, uh, look for respect. And in fact, with this, I understand far better why very often lawyers are unhappy about how they are treated uh, during the investigation process or in court. It may be the case that they're looking for love at courts and during the investigation process, whereas they should be uh, seeking respect. That's an outstanding idea. Thank you for it. Our next speaker is someone I've known since 2008. He was at that time vice president of the Union of Lawyers of Zurich, Urs Fegel. He is now vice president of the Union of Lawyers of Switzerland, and I hope he will soon preside over it. Thank you. That's good. It's always good to have assistance from the northern country, which is much more important than we are. Thank you, Axel. <laughs> and uh, first of all, the Swiss Bar Association thanks the Federal Chamber of Lawyers of the Russian Federation for the polite invitation to this international legal forum and my possibility to say in this gorgeous city. We also congratulate you, Yuri Pilipenko, for the election of the presidency. And this congratulation is very personal, as Yuri Pilipenko is also the president and a very good president of the Swiss Russian Forum, a forum which works a lot and successfully for a better economic and scientific relations between these two countries. I know that the times are not so easy at the moment, but uh, we are working on it and we are working successfully. Switzerland has very restrict restrictive rules for the independency of lawyers. A lawyer has to be independent from the politically, also from the administration. That's not the problem. He also has to be independent financially and he has to be independent from the client. And that's much more difficult because I know lawyers who have only one client. If this client goes, uh, they make no money anymore and they are truly not independent. And of course, a lawyer can only be employed by a law firm, 
not by a bank or an insurance company or a, one of the big four companies. The lawyers in these companies can only represent, them, represent their employer as an employee, and, but not as a lawyer. I think one of the important rules is also the monopoly for lawyers in the field of civil litigation and criminal litigation. <clears throat> we don't know this monopoly of representation of persons in all administrative cases, but in the other cases. And I think that's also important to strengthen the power and the quality of the legal system. We have completely no restrictions in uh, legal advice and also tax advice, as which are given in other countries. <clears throat> I also have to say that each person can represent itself before court, so this person doesn't need to go to a lawyer, except in very hard criminal cases these are murder cases and things like that, where a lawyer is given to the uh, person on trial. The lawyer has to hold a patent, and this patent or is governed by several rules, above all by European rules, of course. Uh, Switzerland is not a party of the European Union. Nevertheless, we have this agreements with uh, the European Union, we are very proud of it, and we have to follow the rules of the European Union, European Union, especially in the fields of law. But we also have federal laws and partly cantonal laws. Switzerland is very small, but uh, we have 26 cantons who have their own laws. The smallest of the cantons have maybe 30,000 people, really, really small. <clears throat> uh, I think one of the importance of the independence is also the, to follow certain legal requirements. The most important are the interdiction of conflict of interest, of course, and also this attorney client privilege or the professional secrecy, as we heard it just before. This is very important for our job, and but not and not only in criminal cases, surely there, but also in uh, normal civil litigation cases. I think uh, the Swiss bar is quite sure that the uh, independence of the lawyer and a hard bar exam is necessary to guarantee that uh, the client or the public is defended and represented in a very good way. Of course, this position and also the monopoly doesn't please to the lawyers I mentioned before, especially the ones who are working for one of the big four companies. They would like to act as a lawyers uh, before court and that's not possible and we are happy for that. Also, the Swiss Bar Association fights against any liberalization of this uh, monopoly in civil and criminal litigation, which often uh, wants to be done, especially in debt enforcement cases, but they can be very complex. <clears throat> But here we have to say what means independence. Independence for the lawyer is clear and we have probably the same meanings as we heard before from Oxford Filges from Germany or also from France. But uh, we are quite under pressure also from the Anglo-Saxon uh, legal system and we have to fight a little bit the continental system against the Anglo-Saxon legal system. I don't say any system is worse than the other, but uh, not only the Anglo-Saxon or the common law system makes people happy. Also, our system can make, can make people happy and maybe 
even more happy in some cases. So that's a fight we have, and we, we like to fight that, we're lawyers. And I also want to, would like to mention what we heard before, also from Germany, that's the importance of the third power of the judiciary. And the Swiss Bar Association starts a new program in summer of this year, and they really want to strengthen the position of the third power of the judiciary, meaning the lawyers and the judges and even the prosecutors to, uh, against uh, the legislative and uh, the executive. And of course, this first and second power are also the ones which are taken over and we really have to put something against them. Many things which I would have liked to say were already said before and I completely agree. That's why I'm really short and I will give my uh, speech back to the President, Juhi Pedipenko. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That was our last panelist. And, uh, well, first of all, I'm sure we have questions, and I believe that we might spend some time uh, talking and discussing. There is some time left, and I know that two people uh, want to speak, uh, Professor Lazarev and Mr. Terrier. Who is the first, if you still want to speak, who is the first to come here to the podium and grab the mic? No, I, I'm afraid you have to come here because uh, we don't have a portable mic. Yes, you can stay where you are if you have a mic. Dear distinguished members of the panel, dear colleagues, uh, my name is Charles Tellier. I'm the secretary of the Judges Forum, of the International Bar Association, and that's a great honor for for us, for me, and for the. I think, sorry, and it's a great honor for the International Bar Association to to be present here today. So. Just a quick word about the IBA. That's, that's um, an association that was created in 1947 and that gathers now more than 55,000 lawyers and legal practitioners coming from 200 law societies and bar associations and coming from 160 countries. Um, judges are involved as well in that uh, association. And that's one of the interesting things we can do there. It's possible for judges and lawyers to talk together, which is something that doesn't really very happen very often in our country sometimes. And that's why as well I'm very honored to be, to be able to uh, take the floor now. Um, like the previous speakers said, everything was already said, so I'm not going to be long and I just say a few words, but maybe one topic that wasn't uh, really discussed now, which is corruption. I think corruption in the judiciary is probably now the biggest threat to impartiality and independence. Um, Mr. Filgus earlier was talking about ideology that was obviously the major threat in previous times. I think now this threat is no longer as big as it used to be, fortunately. But corruption is probably um, a major threat in some countries. But corruption is very difficult to assess as neither the corrupter nor the corrupted have any interest of disclosing it. So it's hard to quantify and only perception of corruption is possible to, to, to be assessed. It's nevertheless a good barometer of the trust or mistrust of citizens for the entire system. And for example, in my country, in France, um, the perception of corruption, I think, is much higher than actual corruption, but still having a high perception of corruption can be, can be interesting to know. Um, so in this regard, I will just present you the example of an activity we have in, in, in the International Bar Association, which is the Judicial Integrity Initiative. 
Our President David Rifkin launched in January 2015 the Judicial Integrity Initiative, conceived to combat judicial corruption where it exists by fo focusing on the role of legal professionals and using the resources and experience of the global IBS membership. So the initiative aims to first raise awareness of the causes and consequences of judicial corruption. Second, promote the highest standards of integrity among judges and lawyers. And third, consider how countries have worked effectively to eliminate judicial corruption. Um, I currently work in the Balkans, in former Yugoslavia, and in these countries, one idea was, for instance, to increase the wage of judges. And I think it was the same in Russia a few years ago. I mean, increasing the wage of judges can be, can be a good way. Um, in the Balkans, another possibility was to create disciplinary bodies in order to prosecute or to uh, stress the disciplinary liability of judges. The issues to take to tackle are the lack of knowledge of the different forms of corruption, the lack of education in the specific field for lawyers and judges, and sometimes inadequate practices, and an existing mistrust between lawyers and judges and mistrust of the judicial system caused by corruption. And that's a point that has been talked before. I mean, judges, prosecutors, lawyers sometimes don't talk together enough, and that's something really important. And I'm sometimes sad that in uh, countries in transition, lawyers are not involved enough in the discussions about reforming the judiciary. Um, the project plan will establish indicators and will engage the legal profession and the judiciary in a number of jurisdictions to become agents of change. And the initiative will be conducted in two parts. The first part will involve the production and dissemination of a typology study on the forms of corruption that occur between judges and lawyers. There will be a research questionnaire and in-country consultations. The second part of the project will involve the implementation of activities which will be chosen and designed on the basis of the findings of the previous step. During the drafting of the report, the information that has been collected will be used to identify and design the most effective activities to be undertaken in the second stage of the project. And that second stage could be forums between lawyers and judges in order to promote dialogue, workshops in order to educate them, both lawyers and judges, on the risks factors and the pathways to corruption and equip them with the tools to manage and avoid these risks. Could be as well a collaboration with other organizations like NGOs and possibly other institutions and the production of a judicial integrity best practice compilation. Just one last word. Several countries have already taken part to the project, Mexico, the Philippines, Nigeria, Peru, Ukraine, and Croatia, all countries which have a big problem of perception of corruption in the judiciary. And combating corruption in justice will take time and will need the help of all the legal practitioners. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A great idea about corruption. You said that one of the methods to fight corruption is to pay higher salaries to judges, to improve uh, funding of the judiciary. In 2007, Russia spent 72 billion rubles on the judicial system. Seven, eight years later, in 2015, if I remember correctly, the figure is 172 billion rubles. And if this method is as efficient as we believe, then I hope uh, that the judicial corruption will be brought to an end in this country in the near future. Thank you very much, Professor Lazare. And if any of the participants want to ask questions of the colleagues sitting to my right and left, you may do that, because it is not very often that we get together. Can I have a mic, please? The mic is on. It is. Uh, lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, for some time uh, I've uh, cherished some special respect for the court because in the Institute of Legislation where I work, uh, we have a department of uh, the judicial decision implementation in Russia's legislation. 
Uh, I hope you remember uh, yesterday when our Prime Minister was talking, he said uh, that um, there is a process of implementing legislative material into the body of legislation. That will go on. I, I mean, different legal systems. And Maybe even the uh, legal system based on judicial precedent, common law system. But I am uh, a continental law expert, uh, the one who said that it's the court which creates law. Uh, Ehrlich Eugen, a continental lawyer, was looking at law as something living, the living law, which is created in court. And here I have a quarrel with the defense bar community because somehow they ignore the fact that. It is in that capacity that the defense attorneys, when they speak in court, they contribute to creating certain rules, no matter whether we accept the precedent or not. We all agree that the best judicial practice is incorporated in the law. Therefore, it would be splendid if we could focus really hard on improving our legislation. I think that only a truly independent court, the court which aspires to achieve objective truth, of course, we cannot, can never achieve it. We only aspire to achieve it. Like we aspire to achieve a dream, and the mathematicians always say that you cannot calculate the uncalculatable, the eternal. But because there is eternity, we don't say that we never calculate anything. So even if the objective truth is unattainable, and here I agree with Henry Resnick. Anyway, there are, uh, even if there's always loopholes, it doesn't mean that we stop trying to achieve the truth. I would emphasize now that unfortunately very often we ignore the fact that as we try to achieve the objective truth, it is not only the factual side that matters. There are two stages of the process, establishing facts of the case and the legal aspect, uh, whereby you establish truth as well. In that respect, the truth in the rules we apply is a very complicated process. Uh, there's two different academic schools in my country. One school says that you cannot estimate, assess the law from the point of view of the truth, and the opposing school believes it is possible. Uh, I, I believe that those uh, rules are something that you cannot assess from the point of view of the truth. But look at the Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court uh, does not examine facts. They do not take facts into account. What they do, they establish the truth in the legal context the truth of our new laws, the truth of the interpretation in terms of developing approaches. In that respect, the lawyers have a lot to do. Thank you very much. I hope that's not the only dimension in which the lawyers have a lot of promise ahead of them. You're exactly right, and I'll begin where I entirely agree with you that the norm is something that's due, but they cannot 
assess it in terms of true or false, because it's not about stating the facts of life, it's a matter of the way one views it and evaluates it. And many different circumstances may interfere with it. So you can talk about compliance with the requirements, the logical grounding, the reason to it as to the truth in the criminal investigation. Well, there is no such thing as an abstract truth in a criminal investigation. So people who work in the law enforcement agencies, some of my colleagues, researchers, and I still believe I somewhat belong to the science and the research, they talk of truth and it's this lofty word they apply to um, investigation to the court proceedings because they either misled or they mislead their listeners. There is no such thing as an abstract truth in the criminal investigation. You see, when you once you have a suspect, the truth manifests itself in the conflict confrontation of two opposed views. It's not abstract. You have someone specific who is accused of a crime, who is a suspect, who may be under arrest for several months already, who may even be in prison, whether or not he is guilty. That's the question one asks himself. So when they say the court is there to determine or identify the truth, um, this is exactly where you get the principle of adversarity. And also, lastly, I would like to agree with you on that a good, a proper court resolution should be reflected in the legislation. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. As someone specialized in the procedural work, I have issues and claims with a number of instructions of the Constitutional Court that grant the courts with a right to aggravate the accusation. And I believe this is a, uh, an instruction that is opposed to the principle of adversarity. And that's why I can state that not all the resolutions taken at the court level lead to positive, good legal norms and standards. Thank you. Well, I believe it's not a matter of great conflict. It's just that you're a researcher, so you're lifting this whole discussion to a pretty abstract height. As a moderator, I would like to get us all back down to earth, a little closer there, even more so since our conference ends at 6 p.m., which is just in a few minutes. And I would like to conclude this uh, conference on the following. I believe the major conclusion here is the following one. Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel uh, here by reminding ourselves that independent legal system is very important now. And independence and respectable, strong judicial system is impossible without an independent, strong lawyers. And that's where the lawyers and attorneys have a lot of prospect and a lot of future in store for them. And on this we conclude now, the colleagues, I would like to share with you some of the Russian hospitality. And I would like to ask our staff to present a little souvenirs to our guests. But I would like to especially note the contribution of Mr. Filgis, because he really has made a tremendous con uh, contribution into the development of the relations of the Russian lawyers and the German lawyers. He has brought together the Russian lawyers and attorneys, and he has contributed a whole new spirit into the relations between the lawyers and attorneys of different countries. So on behalf of the Russian lawyers, I would like to present you with this little souvenir. It's the emblem of our Russian lawyers and attorneys. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, and a round of applause to our speakers.